Welcome to We Mean Business. I'm Steve Dorfman. When it comes to customer service, customer satisfaction, customer loyalty, do you feel that businesses in general are in need of a customer service revolution? Well, that's what John DeJulius, today's guest, loves to talk about. We had him on three years ago talking about his book, Secret Service, Hidden Systems That Deliver Unforgettable Customer Service. And today, we're talking about John's book, What's the Secret to Delivering a World-Class Customer Experience? John's worked with the big dogs, companies that are known for customer service like Nordstrom, uh, Panera, uh, Harley-Davidson, you know, all the, all the big names that, uh, that we've come to know as, as the benchmark for customer service, Nordstrom, Lexus, and, and many, many more. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Welcome. Glad to be here. So again, three years ago, in 2009, we were talking about, um, you know, the, the book Secret Service and these, these great... I love it. These secret systems that, or these hidden systems that deliver unforgettable customer service, as, and as you say, the things that have customers leave you scratching their heads, thinking, "How'd they know that? How'd they do that?" So, with this book, what's the secret to delivering a world-class customer experience? How much of the secret is secret service? A, a huge percent. I mean, what's the secret is really uh, my ability to crack the code and find out why is customer service so rare? Why is uh, world-class customer service kept only 3% of, of organizations out there? And, uh, you know, that was very frustrating both as a, a, a business owner, entrepreneur, and as a consultant. Um, why do companies like Nordstrom's and the Ritz-Carlton's and, and you know, uh, Lexus's of the world get 50,000 employees to execute world-class customer service when so many of us struggle with a team of 10 or 50? So that, that's really, you know, the secret what's to, to what's the secret is really cracking the code on, you know, how these companies do it on a daily basis and so many of us, you know, just talk about. Yeah, perfect. You know, I've, I've, I've read um, the book and, and it's just such a comprehensive guide to uh, really cracking the code, as you said. I, I think it's fantastic. And I, I have to ask you, in our, in our recent economy, I mean, obviously in these last few years, uh, we've seen a number of companies that, um, that haven't done so well. Some have gone belly up, and others have actually thrived in a bad economy. Do you, do you feel that, that um, delivering a world-class customer experience is the differentiator? Have we seen a, have we seen a correction in, our, in, our, in, our, um, in the number of businesses that are actually making it because of this? Yeah, I mean, you've seen both. It's kind of like the wealth in America. Um, more people have... Uh, um, have gone and become better, above the average, and world class, and, and uh, more people have, have uh, gone the opposite way, and the average, level three, average customer service is actually disappearing when that used to be the majority, and, and it's exactly what you said. People have found that it is the number one competitive advantage you could have now, so investing in that is really, I mean, you know, look at, look at the companies like Zappos, I mean, you know, through all this, they are growing by leaps and bounds, and they, you know, they're world class, and they sold for $1.2 billion, and they continue to do great. Amazon, um, Apple, I mean, you know, Starbucks, all these companies have, have revolutionized their industry and changed the complete paradigm. Um, many companies that don't want to fight uh, in the experience wars, which I prefer because the experience wars, uh, there's not a lot of people fighting there. Um, they choose to fight in the price wars. And, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be there. Price wars are ugly. Uh, you know, they take you to a place where you know, it's hard to get out of. So everything that, that What's the Secret talks about is making price irrelevant. And, and the definition of making price irrelevant is based on the experience your customers consistently receive from your organization. They have no idea what your co competition charges because they're not out price checking. You know, and, and, and most of us as customers, we know where we go and, and, and we'll drive an extra, you know, three miles to save 50 cents on something, not realizing we lost in the exchange. But we all have a few businesses that we, we do business regardless. Where we, we have no idea what the competition charges. And that's where I want to live as a business owner. And that's where the clients that I work with want to live. And uh, you know, don't get in the price worse. So, you know, speaking of price, John, I, I have to ask you, that there, I think there are a number of people out there, consumers, who, and, and businesses alike, who, who really think that price does matter. 
you know, there are businesses that say, you know, when it, at the end of the day, it, it's just about who's got the best price, and if we're higher than our competition, then of course they're going to go to our competition. And then there's those clients, those prospects, who say the same thing. They say, look, at the, at the end of the day, it's just about who's offering the best price. Do you think that we don't know ourselves as well as we think we do, or, or what's the story there? Yeah, it, it all depends on the model uh, and the business model. Um, you know, can you get a cheaper cup of coffee and, and argue that it's just as good than, than a Starbucks? Absolutely. Uh, you know, but you know, look at their their growth. Uh, look at their lines every morning compared to the other places. So um, that's why you know they, they choose to create an overall experience. Versus someone who's literally selling you a commodity. And a commodity is everything these days. There's a lot of smart attorneys out there. There's a lot of smart accountants. There's a lot of smart doctors. So, uh, you, know, uh, you know, intellectual capital by itself is a commodity. Uh, you know, you need, you need something more if you want to differentiate yourself. Or, you know, like we said, you got to get in the price wars and you better be the cheapest. You either better be the best or the cheapest. John, in this book, you talk about attracting people that have customer service in their DNA. So, first, I'd like to find out, you know, how do we do that, and uh, and secondly, uh, why is that so important? So, the, 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 every time I, I, I speak, uh, you know, work with a company, and it could be the hundredth time, I always start off every uh, workshop or presentation with service aptitude. Service aptitude is a person's ability to recognize opportunities to exceed customers' expectations regardless of the circumstances. The biggest point I want to make here is you can't, you don't find people with high service aptitude. None of us had it. You know, Steve, you didn't have it when you just got out of school. I didn't have it. Um, you know, our frontline employees don't have it when they come to us. And that is so important because we uh, tend to blame the frontline employee way too much. And, you know, think about it. Would you ever have an accountant uh, do someone's tax returns that was not uh, licensed, certified, and didn't have a CPA or a degree in accounting? Would you ha ever have a, a, a you know, a, a mechanic fly a plane that you didn't take any flying lessons or, <laughs> or got his pilot's uh, license? No. Why do we let people every day... Uh, deal with our customers, our most precious assets, that have no soft skill training. If you think about uh, most companies' training, um, you know, almost 100%, the vast, vast majority, is technical and, and the product knowledge and how to process orders and how to, what screens to be on and all those things. So service aptitude comes from three primary places. The first one is previous life experiences. So as we all know, you know, 18 to, to you know, 25 year olds don't make enough that affords them to fly first class, stay at five star resorts, yet we expect them to give a, to deliver that type of experience to our clients. Um, one of my pet peeves is when we say the golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated. I, I don't agree with that because I don't want my 18 year old. Steve, you wouldn't want my 20 year old son uh, treating your clients the way he wants to be treated. He's a great kid, but he's probably going to give him a fist pump. And you're probably going to have to tell him to pull up his jeans higher than he's wearing them, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but he has the potential. He definitely has the potential. But we have to train them. The second place is previous work experiences. So now you get a 22-year-old who's super nice and very, very sweet on an interview and smiles a lot. But the last place they worked, their supervisor, their boss, was very paranoid. Because as we know, most companies aren't world class. And uh, so they said, hey, listen, Steve, uh, people are out here to take advantage of us. It's your job not to let them. And Steve, young Steve, says, okay, I won't let them. Well, they come to us. We've got to unbrainwash them. We want you to be naive. We don't want you to be paranoid. And then the third place is, is what I said earlier, was, is, is current work experiences. What's the message? We say on our website and all our, our marketing that customer first, customer centric, but how much are we training them? So there's two different you know, answers to, to your question. One is we have to dictate service aptitude. No one's going to have it when they come to us. But not everyone has the potential to have high service aptitude. So you do have to do some hospitality, genuine hospitality engagement screening um, to see if they, 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 can, they have the, the basic foundation, that training. If they don't have the basics, uh, all the service aptitude training in the world won't change yet. So I'll just give you one quick example. 
um, because I know this is a long answer to this, but on our interview and a lot of companies we work with, we do the five E's. And uh, that's what we want you to do when you work uh, in face-to-face positions. The five E's are eye contact, enthusiastic greet, ear to your smile, um, engage me, and educate me. So that's what we want every employee to do, and that's measurable. When I'm interviewing you or when someone's interviewing you, you don't know that's what we're counting. We're counting how many times you make eye contact. You, we're counting how many times you smile, how many times you show enthusiasm, how, much, how, how engaging are you. Uh, so, uh, obviously, the interviewer has to be doing those things, but you can't gain that, and that tells us if we want to you know, bring that person aboard. That's fantastic. You, you, you've got to wonder how many, how many companies are that intentional about the interview process, actually taking note of how many times somebody is uh, acting enthusiastic or smiling or you know, all, those, all those, uh, those great things. How can you know, though, if you've hired somebody, and we've all made the mistake of hiring the wrong person who we thought had the service aptitude for the, for the position, but you know, it just turns out that, that it, it, things, things just aren't looking good for this person, and they aren't delivering a world-class customer experience. How can you know when it's time to maybe part ways with that employee? You know, that's, that's the thing Like uh, goes back to the, uh, great training, uh, thorough orientation, Get them excited uh, about the company and their opportunities, part they play with it. Put them through the soft skill training. And we have a service aptitude test that we also, it's in the book, a sample of it. Um, you can download one off our website. Uh, but uh, a service aptitude test is like 50 to 75 multiple choice questions that uh, you probably wouldn't have known to do. Uh, but, but the best answer is there, and it's obvious most of the time. Um, you know, you, you pick C because it's the best of the four choices. But you may not have known to do C uh, before you took the test. So, John, recognizing that every company and every industry is a little bit different, let's talk about training for a moment. Um, you know, I have to wonder that uh, every, since every, every industry and every company is a little bit different, is there, is there sort of a general rule of thumb that you can, that you can provide us with that most companies should follow? In other words, how often should we be implementing some, some form of training? Should it be something we do monthly, quarterly? What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, one of my favorite quotes is annual customer service training is like deodorant, and within time uh, it wears off and the smell comes back, right? So, it, it, you know, world class is not uh, an event. It's not a ribbon cutting ceremony, and we never arrive. It has to be something that, that uh, everyone is dedicated to, literally on a daily basis. And world class starts at the top, um, meaning you could look at every world class customer service company and see who their leader was, and, and they, you know, they believed in it so much. On the flip side, you could tell uh, when world class uh, doesn't exist, you could look at the leader. And, and the one example of that really resonated was uh, I think around September, Spirit Airlines, uh, you, you may have heard this because it was a big uh, to-do in social media, Spirit Airlines uh, was uh, declined a, a, a Vietnam veteran, uh, booked a $179 flight, found out he had terminal cancer, um, couldn't fly, the guy was uh, dying, and they wouldn't give him a refund because he didn't buy the insurance. So they interviewed the CEO. And he says, you know, basically, no. I mean, he didn't buy the insurance. Uh, he should have bought the insurance. Oh, by the way, Spirit Airlines is the most complained about airline in the United States. I've seen a lot of power in, in story sharing. That's great, great advice. You know, the great Steve Jobs said that a lot of times people don't know what they want until you show it to them. So, John, we've got to take a break. But, you know, thinking back on that, reflecting on that quote, I have to wonder if customers actually know what they want when it comes to the customer experience. You're watching We Mean Business. We're here with John DeJulius. We'll be back in seconds. Every book is an adventure waiting to come to life. Visit new worlds. Encounter new friends. And discover the power of reading. Go to read.gov to read A Princess of Mars, the first novel to feature John Carter. A new world awaits. Read. 
Welcome back to We Mean Business. I'm Steve Dorfman, and today we've got with us John DeJulius. John is talking with us about his book, What's the Secret to Delivering a World-Class Customer Experience? And John, just before the break, you know, I, I asked you about this quote from Steve Jobs. A lot of times, people don't know what they want until you show it to them. So in the context of, of the customer experience, is, is that also true? You know, I, I'm a, a Steve Jobs fanatic. I have a hundred Steve Jobs quotes, and it, whatever one we bring up, I will tell you that's my favorite. So I have a hundred. <laughs> right. quotes. But you, you really did hit on the one that I use in every presentation. Um, don't uh, ask the customer what they want. Give them what they can't live without. And I love that so much because think about it. Let's say it's 1975, and we do a focus group and ask coffee drinkers what they'd like in a coffee experience. They'd laugh at you. They'd say, a what? They'd say, a coffee <laughs> experience. There's two ways, with or without cream, with or without sugar, right? <laughs> right. And, and you know, basically for 25 cents or free, um, I doubt anyone would have said, hey, I'd love to spend 10 times as much, um, <laughs> have over literally 80,000 different ways I could order it and get it, and have the opportunity to hang out for 15 minutes or two hours, should I wish. No one would have given you that. No one would have given you the iPhone, the iPad, the iMini, the iTouch, all these things that have revolutionized business. So while it's important to measure customer satisfaction and what your customers are saying, customers don't know what is capable until you create it. In the world of customer service, how can we best measure um, the, you know, the money that we're investing in, in delivering a world-class customer experience? Well, that, that, that's a really good question with a lot of answers. Uh, the, the, the first chapter talks about the smoking gun, and that, that talks about uh, the significant competitive financial advantage because, you know, customer service seems, you know, theoretic and warm and fuzzy, but is there a true return on investment? That's where it shows, looking at the top 20% customer satisfaction companies in all industries, Compared by the three markets, and they outperform the, the Dow Jones by 93 percent, the S and P 500 by 203 percent, and Nasdaq by like three, four hundred percent. And it just shows the you know unequivocal you know argument that what the advantage is. Superior customer service companies against their 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 competitors always have higher comp sales, always have more referrals. Customers are less price sensitive more brand loyalty. Uh, they are less affected by outside conditions, meaning who's running for president and you know the mortgage crisis and all that. Um, but the biggest thing, and they, uh, the, 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 before I get there, and they market the least, which I love that, because mm -hmm. they have raving fans doing it for themselves. But the biggest thing that was really an aha for me in this study, seven year study, is they have higher employee morale and lower employee turnover. Bam! I mean, that's that's huge. Uh, but let me jump to, to the other part of, of, of uh, the answer. Is there's several ways we have to measure. First, we have to have baselines. Whether it's average tickets, resign rates, retention rates, whatever your baseline is. So as you start this revolution, you can compare it and hold people accountable, uh, um, as well as measuring it. You know, there, there's there's several ways, and I believe all of them are needed. Uh, internal and external. So external is yeah, having a third party company, whether it's a mystery shopper or a company that can, you know, call people up or on the back of your receipt you go online. That, that is, is very important. And, and managers, employees need to sweat. They need to be you know, that, that has to be one of the biggest key drivers that they have to look at every month is their customer measurement compared to everyone else. Promotions, bonuses, everything has to be based on that. But something that uh, people overlook is what you need to do inside, internally. And Steve, you've had this experience, I've had this experience, everyone uh, watching this has had the experience. We have left tons and tons of businesses um, unhappy. And we didn't tell anyone. And, you know, so the last time that happened to me, I'm driving home thinking about the horrible experience and why I'll never go back. And then I start having this conversation with myself is why? Why did I not tell anyone? And then I'm thinking, well, I just, I, I got the feeling they didn't care. Um, I'd have to ask for a manager. Um, he'd eventually come out and think I was trying to get something for free. And, you know, to be honest, I'd rather be home 20 minutes early and uh, not then go through that. Well, my next thought is, 
how often does that happen to me in, in, in either of my businesses? Probably a lot more than I realize. So I started thinking about why if I tell certain companies that I was disappointed, only a few versus the rest I just don't tell. It's because they, they give me the impression that they care, um, that they're going to do something with it. So the first thing I went back is you know, I put signs up you know, in, in, in my B2C business, the salon and spa, how was your experience? I want to know about it. And you know, here's my email, here's my cell phone number. If someone was a hero for you, tell me. If we missed the mark, I want to know about it. And you wouldn't believe the, the, the increased feedback I got. Now, I certainly got more um, criticism than we got before, but they were all valid, and we needed to know about it. And we retained those customers. But the thing, the, the pleasant thing was I got so many above and beyond stories that we never knew were happening because we weren't asking for them. So now I get this wow. great story that I can, back to the storytelling, celebrate and foster that kind of relationship. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, John, I would imagine that a, a number of business owners are maybe afraid to put their, uh, their personal contact information uh, for fear of just not being able to handle it all. Maybe they've got their head buried in the sand, which is a much bigger problem. But, you know, maybe they're just afraid that they won't be able to handle all of the inbound feedback that they're going to get uh, you know, even the good stuff. I mean, you you want to make sure that you're responding to the, the the customers that are sharing the positive stories as well. You don't just want to share that story with your staff and never let the the customer know what impact they had. Of course, you want to tell the customer. Not only did you make my day with your story, but I shared your story at our meeting this morning. And yeah, so there's there's such power there. But I would imagine a lot of uh, business owners are just afraid, maybe, of not being able to field. Um, the amount of the amount of feedback that, that they're going to be getting. What do you have to say to those folks? You know, Steve. Uh, to be honest, it's it's not uh, as bad as you think. And uh, I would say, of the feedback I've gotten in, in the course since we've done it, ninety five percent has been via email, and they're all nice and they, they appreciate the, the me asking. Um, but they say, hey, I thought you'd like to know, and that's great. I mean, you know, we get back to them, we fix it, we we learn from it, we use it. Um, it's probably more than 95%. I have only gotten, like, I think two phone calls, and it wasn't on a Sunday at 3 or, or midnight. It was in the afternoon, got a message, called them back as soon as I could, and, you know, they, they were upset, and they were glad that they were able to voice that. And I think I got two texts, and the texts were positive. They weren't negative, but saying, you know, so glad I have this opportunity to tell you what a rock star Tina was. So it's not, you know, and let's go back to the Starbucks example. Many years ago, about 10 years ago, Starbucks introduced this card that if, if, if you don't have a great experience, if you're made to wait too long, you have to come back with a drink or, or whatever that wasn't made right. They, they, they give you this card that says your next drink is on them. So what do you think uh, when they rolled this out 10 years ago, their fear was? Uh, I don't know. That, that if, yeah, they were giving away the fire. That people would be getting free drinks left and right. Oh, sure, yeah. 10 years later, guess what they're disappointed in? <laughs> How few people are... Yeah, are using it and not using it to customers, but like uh, the frontline employees. You know, why would you give that to that guy? He came here from his lunch, ordered twelve drinks for everyone at work, and it came back because we screwed up two of them, or we shorted him two of them, and you gave him the two, and, and you're all you know thinking you did great. Well, there was a great opportunity to use one. Huh? I didn't think of it. So you don't get taken advantage of. But the point of putting the the, the um, cell phone number on there is really demonstrating, I do want to hear. I guarantee if I didn't put my cell phone number on there, yeah, I wouldn't have gotten that one or two calls, but I wouldn't have gotten as many, many emails because that is really, you know, putting my, my, my words where my mouth is and saying, that's how much I want to know. You have access to me 24-7. Great stuff, John. You know, one, another thing that you, that you talk about is service recovery. So, you know, in, in dealing with uh, having this open door for feedback from your, from your customers and clients, talk to us a little bit about what service recovery is and how best to handle it. So that's the uh, zero risk commandment, and we, we talked, uh, you know, a little bit about that just now. But what zero risk doesn't mean is that we'll never screw up. They might say we have all of us, all, all our businesses. That's impossible. What zero risk does mean is while you may complain about what went wrong, you're going to rave about how well we handled that. And that's really what, what zero risk looks like. Um, there's two parts to be in zero risk. Let's look at where we dropped the ball the most and see if we can create processes and efficiencies and systems 
to reduce that. That's one part, very important. But, as you know, we're not going to eliminate it. We're human beings. We're dealing with human conditions, human elements. Technology can go down, weather, anything. So now, if we can get it to happen from 9% of the time to only 4% of the time, that's huge. But it's still going to happen 4% of the time. And it's going to happen every week. So why do we act like a deer in headlights when someone's appointment isn't down than they thought or, or, or we thought or the order didn't make it or, or the order was inaccurate? That's going to happen, hopefully a lot less. So the second part of being zero risk is creating service recovery protocols that you're more impressed that something went wrong in the way we handled it than had you just ordered two books from me, you got them in two to three days, yeah, I mean, you're not doing somersaults. You're not calling anyone and saying, hey, I, you know, this is so cool. I got these two books. You should have gotten them. Now, if you call up and say, hey, I ordered two books. I ordered two what's the secret, and you sent me one secret service, and that was it. Hey, send them five books. Throw them a DVD. <laughs> I have next day air it, and it should, you write a handwritten note. Now, this is memorable versus had you just gotten the two books, right? right. So, so that's what we have to have is where are we going to drop the ball? And let's not act like a deer in headlights when it happens. And let's empower our frontline employee to be a hero in this situation. Fantastic, John. Well, listen, in the seconds that remain, what are your predictions for customer service in 2013? It's great. It's, it's really exciting. The revolution, the customer uh, service revolution is really picking up steam. Um, we just had our fourth uh, Secret Service Summit two weeks ago. And uh, it, it sells out every year. And it's just, it's just so good to see more and more companies embracing this and building their cultures around it and using it as a tool to hire and promote. And, you know, it, it's really, really exciting. Um, and we're seeing this revolution take full. Well, John, as always, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, we look forward to your next book. To learn more about John DeJulius and his books, Secret Service, and What's the Secret to Delivering a World-Class Customer Experience, visit WeMeanBiz.tv. Thanks for joining us today. We'll catch you next time.